first of all, I want to say what a pleasure it is to be here with the, my other panelists. Um, and thank you also to all of you for coming. And above all, I think, thank you to UN Watch for organizing this event and the other extremely important events that are taking place today. And I would just like to mention um, what an incredible organization UN Watch is. They didn't pay me to say this, but they are, I think, one of the most effective NGOs that are fighting against the bias and anti-Israel uh, prejudice of the United Nations. Um, I, I'm going to start off by talking about my favorite subject, which is me. Um, and then I'm going to speak uh, briefly about the, uh, the way that um, Hamas has operated and what their intentions are, and finally about the IDF and their response. So most importantly and most interestingly, me. Um, I, I was in the British Army for 30 years, and during that time, I often commanded British forces in operations against violent demonstrators, rioters, in a number of different places. And in each and every situation, among those rioters, there were also armed terrorists who had orchestrated the riot and used and manipulated the riot in order to attack security forces. So in some respects, very similar to the situation that we have on the border today. But in every case that I was involved in, the situation was much more simple and straightforward because we were able to, um, to get in among the rioters, to, to envelop the rioters, to get behind them, and to, to contain the situation, and to deploy ourselves in a way that made us less vulnerable to the terrorists in their midst. Now, of course, unless they went in to Gaza, effectively a foreign country, unless they went into Gaza uh, and made an incursion into Gaza, of course, the IDF were in a very, very different situation and a disadvantageous situation. In all my observations that I've made of the way the IDF operated, um, I, I used my personal experience and my knowledge of these kind of situations to try and figure out how the IDF could have done things differently. And I'll be entirely honest, even after doing this myself many, many times, I could not work out a single way that the IDF could have operated differently and still achieved their objectives. Yet, still, other people, British Army officers, American officers, officers from different countries, as well as politicians, media, people representing so-called human rights organizations, NGOs, etc., tell me personally and also tell the world that Israel should have behaved differently. But not one of them, not a single one of them, has told me how Israel should have dealt with that situation effectively but differently. And I'm still waiting if anyone who's maybe watching this online has got any suggestions to make, and I guarantee you, you haven't. Um, I was, in, I was uh, on the Gaza border on a numerous occasions since this violence began, including right down at the very front line among the snipers, among the commanders, among the observers, and I saw what happened on numerous occasions. And my uh, views on this um, are formed to a large extent by that personal experience, which is experience that those people who have condemned Israel in the United Nations uh, Commission of Inquiry have not had. They have not had that either personally and directly on the ground, because they didn't go near the place, and nor have any of them got any military experience or experience of international law as it applies to this situation. Not one of them. And not only that, ladies and gentlemen, but to my knowledge, they don't have a military advisor. And if they do have a military advisor, then that military advisor is being kept very, very quiet and under wraps. And I don't know why that could be, but I'd like to know. I'd like to know who it is, where he comes from, what his relevant expertise is. Because how can you take a report like this, this, this infamous document, how can you say that seriously if you don't know the extent of the military advice that's gone into it? Because this is a military, well, you could say military, you could also say a policing situation. But to my knowledge, there's no experience behind it at all, which, apart from all the other flaws with this report, throws its credibility into enormous question. Um, I, I gave evidence to this investigation here in Geneva in December. I, I provided a written submission, which is available online at a, um, a website of the, what's called the High Level Military Group, which is a group of about 15 retired generals from around the world who I uh, am a part of. Although I'm a humble colonel, I'm still allowed to 
mix with these generals at their, in their elevated level. Um, but, but I wrote that submission on their behalf, uh, which you can look at, and I gave personal um, verbal evidence to the Commission here in Geneva in December. Um, not, once, not once did I have any interaction with any military advisor. They, they, there was always excuses why he was not available or couldn't speak. And this, this is extraordinary when they specifically asked me, as a military so-called expert, to come and talk to them, yet they couldn't provide anybody who, who had any military knowledge. And indeed, those people I spoke to who, who were on the commission um, knew nothing, nothing about any military issue. I know that from the verbal interaction I had with them. Absolutely zero knowledge, experience or understanding, which is shocking in an investigation of this sort. And I can also tell you, ladies and gentlemen, that on, in this report, not one word, not one single word that I told them is reflected in this. Not one word. I'm not saying that in order to sort of say, well, don't hold me responsible at all for this. I'd rather you didn't. But the fact is that I think I was probably the only independent military advisor that actually gave them direct evidence. Um, and they ignored it. They ignored every single word that I said. Um, the, 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 the background, the, the sort of Hamas motivation, Hamas intentions, etc., I want to speak briefly about that, which, again, is totally misrepresented and, and distorted in this report. Um, but what they, what they were doing on this so-called Great March of Return was to continue the strategy they've been following for a long time from Gaza, which is a combination of different actions which, which include, but not limited to, rocket firing. And of course, we, we saw the latest rocket firing, um, which actually targeted Tel Aviv as well as other places only a few days ago. Of course, that was by mistake, um, so we're told. But uh, that, that campaign of rocket firing, attack tunnels dug underneath the Israeli border to massacre and abduct Israeli civilians in near, nearby communities in the borders. Um, and other actions, but these things are all intended, they're not actually intended to seriously damage Israel or seriously damage the IDF. That's not their intention at all, because they know that they can't do it. They couldn't succeed militarily against Israel. It's impossible for them, but not even really to inflict significant damage. Their idea and it's the same idea as for the Great March of Return, is to lure and compel Israel, the IDF, to, in defending their country and defending their citizens, to inflict civilian casualties on the people in Gaza. That's their ob objective. Why do they do it? They do that in order to uh, bring down international condemnation against Israel and cause the isolation, vilification of Israel and give impetus to the BDS movement and to others who want to damage Israel. That's their intention. Never, I don't think in history, has any military organization, military force, army, whatever you want to call it, never have they acted in a way that has been deliberately intended to have their enemies kill their own civilian population. It's incredible, but that's what they do, and that's why they do it. And this Great March of Return is, has the same intention. It also has the intention, as the rockets do and as the tunnels do, of course, of inflicting some damage on Israel. And of course, they wanted to get through the border fence. And they wanted to send people in very large numbers into Israel with the intention of getting into the Israeli communities, places like Nachal Oz, which is a few hundred meters from the border, and slaughtering Israeli civilians and abducting Israeli civilians and torturing them. That's what their intention was. Um, and, and that would have been done by a combination of Hamas fighters, but also by ordinary people from Gaza who were told and instructed to pick up whatever weapon they could find to bludgeon Israeli civilians to death. And they were provided with maps showing the routes from the Gaza border to the various different Israeli communities near the border. You don't, we've, all of that information is available and you don't need much more indication of what their intention was than that. And of course, they tried it, and they tried it, and tried it, and failed to achieve it in any significant way so far. As to um, the IDF, the IDF uh, 
contrary to what many people believe and what organizations like this here say, the IDF did everything they possibly could to avoid the situation that occurred where they had to actually kill some of these people involved in these violent activities on the border. And just very briefly, there's a lot more detail I could give you, but I'm not going to, but it's in the report I wrote. Very briefly, first of all, the first thing they did was to, when they found out the intention, they warned the population of Gaza not to take part, not to come down to the border because it would endanger themselves. And they, they even went to the extent, for example, of phoning up coach companies in Israel, in the Gaza rather, and telling them, do not come down to the border, do not bring people to the border. Of course, this was all ignored. After that had happened, they then um, they used loudspeakers to warn people coming. They dropped leaflets. They sent text messages. They used every means that are available today to try and dissuade people from coming there. And then when they did come and threatened in very large numbers, I think I'm right in saying that something like 500,000 people have tried to get through the border in the period of this, uh, these incidents, they... They, they then used physical means of deterring them. And the first, the, 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 you know, the sequence is variable, but the first thing I'll mention is tear gas. That was attempted. Plastic bullets attempted also. Water cannon. Um, and, and even the IDF went to the extent, because uh, tear gas is, is, is notoriously difficult to deploy over a lengthy distance, particularly when, when there's a lot of wind, um, as there often is in that area. They went to the extent of designing drones specifically to target tear gas onto specific areas they wanted to hit. Um, and, and numerous other measures that they designed specifically for this situation. But all the methods I've mentioned so far are only really effective at very short range. So for them to become more effective, I've used them myself many times, plastic bullets and tear gas um, and people with, you know, with batons, etc., to smack them around. Um, you've got to get in among them. You've got to get really close and in among the rioters to do that. And, of course, that wasn't an option available to Israel because had they done that, they'd have had to make an incursion into Gaza and they'd have been seriously exposing their soldiers to death. So these things didn't really work that effectively. They tried them as best they could. And ultimately, they had to use lethal force, i.e. shooting them with real bullets. And they tried warning shots, of course, into the air on the ground, and then finally, as a final um, uh, last resort, they, they fired at the legs of some of the demonstrators, but only the key instigators and the leaders and known terrorists of, in, in among these, uh, these people. They fired at the legs. Um, now, why, you may ask, would some of them therefore died? Well, if you've, as I'm sure some people have here, if you've fired... Uh, at people in sometimes confused and difficult situations. Sometimes you miss, sometimes a bullet ricochets, sometimes a bullet goes through someone's legs and into somebody else in the chest perhaps. So it does happen, no matter how much care you take. And the IDF deployed their most experienced snipers along the border, including police snipers from the most, um, the, 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 their top level special forces to ensure that they had the best shots they could. Um, and that was, that was what happened. Um, that's the, the, um, the IDF's reaction. Now, had they not done that, had the IDF not done that, then those people would have got through that border fence. And when they got through, they would have then headed to those communities. And would the IDF have let them get there? No. And how would they have stopped them? They'd have had to shoot large numbers of those people flooding through the border, far more than they ended up having to shoot. And they'd have also had to shoot to kill in most cases. Or, and also, they then had to go and close the breach in the fence. And how do you physically do that in such a chaotic situation without inflicting casualties? So, despite the tragic circumstances in which many people died on the other side, I can assure you that many more would have died had the IDF not acted in the way they did. Um, and in doing so, also, put their own soldiers in greater danger, risking their own lives in order to be more careful about... Uh, prevent, avoiding killing uh, innocent or maybe not so innocent Palestinian protesters. Um, my, my opinion is this report fails the Palestinian people. It fails the Israeli people because it lies. It lies about what happened, deliberately lies, deliberately distorts. 
is deliberately prejudiced against the Jewish state. And you might well ask, in a commission that has a day against Israel, a specific agenda item against Israel, you might well wonder what the motive is for that and what the motive is for distorting a report and giving it, giving it a mandate which is itself distorted, which leaves the, the only conclusion that they're going to achieve that mandate and all they're doing is looking for ways to put on paper to, to achieve the mandate of condemning Israel. Ladies and gentlemen, I told you, I'm about to get a one-minute warning, but I told you, um, I told you that uh, Hamas's objective is to get Israel to, um, to kill innocent civilians, uh, to kill their own innocent civilians in Gaza. Uh, that's, what, that's what happened. And the reason to, to get world vilification, to get organizations like the United Nations Human Rights Council to condemn Israel, well, that's exactly what they've done. And they've played straight into Hamas's hands. And effectively, the United Nations Human Rights Council is an instrument of Hamas terrorism. This organization that we all pay for is an instrument and supporter of Hamas terrorism. And by, by playing into Hamas's hands, they're encouraging Hamas to do it, to carry out more acts of terrorism. And indeed, in a few days' time, there's going to be the anniversary of the Great March of Return, in which Hamas plan greatest levels of violence so far. And that's encouraged by the report into this, by this commission, and it's encouraged by those countries that vote in this commission for this report. So the, we're, we're effectively in among, in that we're in the midst of a supporter of terrorism. It's a, it's a horrible thing to see and a horrible thing to say, but it is in fact true. Thank you.